the essence of the, of the situation is this would not have happened without the sanctions. You could have had the war, uh, and it would have gone pretty much as it has go gone. Uh, but the uh, uh, Russian government in 2022 was in no position to force the exit of Western firms. It would, didn't want to, wouldn't have done that. It was in no position to force its oligarchs to choose between Russia and the West. It didn't wish to do that. Uh, this, this, these choices were imposed by the West, and their results were actually, in many respects, favorable to the long-term independent development of the Russian Federation's economy. I'm James Galbraith, and I, I teach at the University of Texas at Austin. Well, there were numerous stated goals, and the most important ones were uh, to, so to speak, defund uh, the, the war, to uh, deprive Russia of uh, export revenue, to prevent Russia from having access uh, to critical technologies, to um, provide, to put pressure on the Russian regime, uh, both through uh, the civilian population and through this group of exceeding, extremely wealthy people known as the oligarchs. Uh, so there were a range of things to degrade Russia's military capacity. The sanctions were imbued by the advocates of this policy with enormous supposed powers uh, and a whole range of things. And you can go back and, uh, and see the claims that were made in early 2022 uh, and up into the first part of 2023 uh, that the sanctions were, in fact, uh, devastating the Russian economy or uh, rendering it permanently irrelevant uh, to the world. Uh, so this was a, a, an interesting problem that I thought I'd look into and see to what extent those claims uh, had uh, validity and to what extent they were, they were backed up by, by evidence. If you take in particular the leading uh, advocate of sanctions, which I would, I would say was uh, Professor Sonnenfeld at Yale and his team, uh, they, they took the view that the sanctions were effectively destroying the Russian capacity uh, to conduct the war. At the time I wrote this paper, which was in the early part of 2023, I was already fairly well persuaded that this was not uh, working out as they expected. Uh, but the question was, were they wrong on the facts? Or was it something uh, about the interpretation and the analysis that they brought uh, to a body of facts? And that was the question that the paper really uh, tries to address. Well, there was a reduction in the flow of Russian oil and gas. Uh, other uh, materials, minerals in particular, uh, to their Western markets. Uh, so then the question was, does that, how does that affect, the, let's say, Russia's access uh, to international purchasing power? Uh, and the answer to that was, it didn't. Because although Russia sold a smaller volume of oil and gas, it sold it at a higher price. Uh, so its export revenues actually increased, didn't decrease. And secondly, uh, effect of the other sanctions and restricting Russian imports uh, meant that Russia was spending less, less on, for example, imported consumer goods uh, than it had been. And so Russia's current account surplus went up. So if you believe that uh, foreign funding was somehow essential to the Russian war effort, actually the sanctions increased Russia's access to foreign funds. Now, I fact don't believe that this was material in all to the Russian war effort because, uh, in fact, the, the, the Russian war effort was entirely constructed, almost entirely constructed from within Russia. So their, 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 their access to dollars or euro was essentially immaterial. But that was the argument that was being made. And on its own merits, it failed on the grounds I've just stated. Other things which were substantially more material, let's say, uh, access to components, access to imports of uh, equipment, machinery, and that kind of thing, and semiconductors in particular, were thought to be uh, essential to Russia's ability to uh, provide material support for the war. Uh, and the answer to that is, well, first of all, Russia had, this war did not happen uh, by, uh, you know, at, at the last minute, the, the Russians were aware of the risk of being at war for quite some time. So any, any prudent planning would lead to a stockpiling of anything that they actually needed. It is not even clear to me that there were important components 
that they uh, needed to acquire in the West uh, for military purposes. There were components, uh, of course, that they needed to acquire uh, for civilian industry, automobiles, aviation, and a lot of, of, of uh, non-durable goods, they were importing food and various kinds. The reality of that is that the sanctions did interrupt uh, Russian production of many things, cars, appliances. Uh, the the uh, production indices fell very, very sharply in 2022. 20, uh, but then the question is what, happened ne what happens next? Uh, and the answer to that is uh, capacity to produce these major products, for example, automobiles, didn't go away. The factories were there, the workers were there, the managers were there, the engineering was there. So what they needed to do was to replace some designs and some equipment, which they were able to do, in some cases with the assistance of the Chinese, as the Chinese are now major exporters of automobiles. So they, they converted lines that had previously been, let's say, Japanese or European, uh, to uh, Russian lines, uh, Moskvich, Lada, uh, using Chinese designs, and they've restarted those production lines. I don't know that they are back yet to the volumes that they were previously producing, but they'll get there. Uh, it is uh, clearly the industry has been transformed from one which was oriented toward the West uh, to one which is no longer oriented toward the West, and that's really the effect that the sanctions has ha have had on the Russian. Uh, civilian economy, and that's true for both durables and non-durables, uh, poultry and cheese and other grains and fruits and vegetables, all lots of things that Russia imported uh, from, from Europe or from Turkey. Uh, they have in the last eight years, and especially in the last year uh, or so, uh, basically reshored or onshored to the, to, to the Russian Federation itself. And so uh, that, uh, they are making they're, they're making, uh, uh, taking advantage of the opportunities that sanctions gave them. If you go back to the period before the introduction of sanctions in 2014, and even up until 2022, the Russian economy was very heavily colonized by Western firms. Uh, that was true, again, automobiles, it was true in aircraft, it was true in everything from fast food restaurants, big box stores. Uh, Western firms uh, were present all throughout the Russian economy. Uh, a great many of them, not all, but a great many of them, either chose to exit Russia or were pressured to exit Russia after early 2022. So on what terms did they leave? Well, they were required, if they were leaving permanently, uh, to sell their capital equipment, their factories and so forth, to, let's say, a Russian business, which would get a loan from the Russian banks or maybe have other sources of financing, uh, at a very favorable price for the Russians. Uh, so effectively, a lot of capital wealth, which was partly owned by the West, has been transferred to Russian ownership. Uh, and you now have uh, an economy which is uh, moving forward and has the advantage compared to Europe of relatively low resource costs because Russia is a great producer of resources, oil and gas and fertilizer and, and, and foodstuffs and so forth. Uh, and so while the Europeans are paying uh, maybe twice in Germany what they were paying for energy, um, the Russians are not. They're paying perhaps no more and perhaps less than they were paying uh, before the war. So, again, I, I characterize the, the effect of the sanctions, in fact, as being, in certain respects, a gift uh, to the Russian economy. Uh, and this is, I think, quite different from what the authors of the sanctions expected. Um, and the interesting thing here uh, is that, uh, uh, that the assessment of the impact of the sanctions uh, from the West and from the Russian side is not terribly different. Both sides see this as, a, as, a, as having a major impact initially on the Russian economy. The Russian Academy of Sciences issued a report in September of 23 that summarizes this as having a major crisis impact on all sectors of the Russian economy. But the difference is that rather than causing a collapse of the economy, uh, the Russians f see that what actually happened was an adjustment. Uh, and it's an adjustment that you might expect to happen when the conditions are favorable and what you've got is a, essentially a market economy with capable businesses that are able to move into market space which has been created for them 
by the sanctions. And the essence of the, of the situation is this would not have happened without the sanctions. You could have had the war, uh, and it would have gone pretty much as it has go gone. Uh, but the uh, uh, Russian government in 2022 was in no position to force the exit of Western firms. It would, didn't want to, wouldn't have done that. It was in no position to force its oligarchs to choose between Russia and the West. It didn't wish to do that. Uh, this, this, these choices were imposed by the West, and their results were actually, in many respects, favorable to the long-term independent development of the Russian Federation's economy. I don't think that there was that, these, that, that there was an option here that was going to achieve the goals that were set out for sanctions. It is one thing to sanction an, an island economy like Cuba, uh, which has been under sanctions for many decades and uh, has uh, suffered enormously from the sanctions, or uh, an economy which is a essentially a, a pure resource economy like Venezuela. Uh, again, very difficult for an economy in that position uh, to uh, meet all of its requirements under extensive sanctions from the United States and secondary sanctions and all of that. This is not Russia. Russia is not in this position. Russia has one-sixth of the land mass of the world. It has maybe 20 or 30 percent of the world's resources. It has 145 million people. It has extreme competence in science and technology and engineering. Uh, it has, uh, it, it has re after the chaos of the 1990s, it has developed a reasonably effective relationship between the state, uh, the parastatal sector, major corporations like Gazprom, uh, and the private sector. Uh, and so it was in a position uh, to uh, adjust uh, to the sanctions. And also, it has, of course, it has trading partners. Many of them did not impose the sanctions, the most important of them being, of course, China, but that was also true. And the sanctions have not been imposed by major Latin American countries, Brazil, Mexico. Uh, they've certainly not been imposed by African countries. They've not been impo imposed by the BRICS. Uh, so the, the Russia is by no means, this is a situation in which the sanctions were imposed by one important sector of the world economy, which then cut itself off from resources that it needs, and that's particularly true in Western Europe, in return for cutting Russia off from various things that Russia doesn't really need and could do without and could adjust to the absence of. Uh, and that process has been, has been going on since 2014, but it accelerated greatly in 2022, 23.